Chapter 23 Min Lee and the king walked through the garden, and she told him her name and where she was from and all about her journey. Remembering the fish's warning, she carefully did not mention dragon waiting for her in the forest. As they walked, the patterned stone pathways gently massaged her feet, and the sun seemed to disappear like a closing flower. When they finally approached the pavilion, night had fallen. So, the king said, now you have come here to find the guardian of the city. Yes, Minley said, and looked at him expectantly. And you think the guardian is me, the king said. Yes, Minley said. Do you know what the borrowed line is? May I have it? Hmm, the borrowed line, the king repeated, and they stopped in front of the pavilion. The moon's reflection fastened onto the water's surface, and Minley saw why the pavilion was called Clasping the Moon. The image of the moon lay protected in the water like a glowing pearl, and the king stared at it in deep thought. Come, let's eat, and then we'll see what can be done about your borrowed line. So Minley entered the open-air pavilion. At the center, two stools and a small table of elaborately carved ginkgo wood waited for them. A large, finely woven bamboo basket as tall as Minley's waist stood next to the chairs. The king eagerly lifted off its lid and rich, warm aromas floated in the air, making Minley's stomach grumble. The king took out the plates of delicate pink shrimp dumplings, savory noodles and pork, dragon's beard bean sprouts, emerald green chives, and a bowl of white jade tofu soup. A pot of tea and an assortment of cakes sat on the bottom layer of the basket to finish off the dinner. Here you can see their meal they're having. You see them in there? The king handed Minley a pair of intricate gold chopsticks that weighed heavily in her hand, and with his urging, Minley began to eat what was easily the most delicious meal she had ever had. I'm not sure what the borrowed line is that you're looking for, the king told Minley as he sipped on his tea. They had finished eating the main meal, and she was enjoying a turtle-shaped cake filled with sweet and soft red bean paste, a taste not known to her before. As she swallowed, its, rich, its richness seemed to warm her from her throat all the way to her stomach. But, said the king, I think I can guess. With great effort, Minley stopped eating and looked at him. You can? she asked, and suddenly hope filled her. What do you think it is? Do you know why this city is called the City of Bright Moonlight? The king asked. Minley shook her head. My great-grandfather changed the name of this city. It used to be called the City of the Far Remote. But after he came to power, he changed it to the City of Bright Moonlight, the king said. Most people thought it was because he had a poetic heart. But it was more than that. Have you heard the story of the magistrate that tried to outwit the old man of the moon? Minley nodded. Yeah, he tried to kill his son's destined wife, but they ended up together anyway. Ah, you know the story, the king smiled. The magistrate was my great-great-grandfather's father. And this city is the city that his son became the king of through the marriage. So the story is real, Minley said. Well, it is a story that has been passed through my family for generations, the king said. But there's more to it than what most 
have heard. The unknown part of the story of the old man of the moon. So after the old man of the moon told the magistrate that his son would marry the daughter of a grocer, Magistrate Tiger flew into a rage. With both hands, he grabbed the page and tore it from the book. But before he could rip the page in two, the old man's eyes stared into his, and the light of the moon seemed to blind the magistrate still. As the silence hung in the air, Magistrate Tiger's anger slowly turned to fear. Hi, Saffron. But finally, the old man of the moon nodded at him grimly. Pages of the Book of Fortune do not tear easily, but that paper was being sent to you before I borrowed it, the old man said. So perhaps it is only fitting that you finally receive it. Go ahead, take it. The book has bestowed some extra qualities to it, though they will be as useless to you as the original paper would have been. And without another word, the old man of the moon stood up and walked away up the mountain. The magistrate could do nothing but stare, clutching the ripped paper in dumbfounded silence. And that is the unknown part of the story of the old man of the moon. So he tore a page out of the book of fortune, Minley said. Yes, the king said, but he himself was never able to read it. So it remained useless to him, just as the old man of the moon had said it would be. Come, the king said, as he walked out of the pavilion, onto the bridge and under the moon. As Minley followed, he reached inside the breast of his shirt and slowly took out a gold-threaded pouch and said, This is the ripped page. It has been passed down from generation to generation, studied by the kings of the city of bright moonlight. None of us has ever understood what the old man of the moon meant when he said it was borrowed. Minley watched, fascinated, as the king took from the gold pouch a delicate folded piece of paper. Paler than even the white jade tofu she had eaten for dinner, the paper seemed to have a light of its own, dimming the gold threads of the pouch that held it. It was my great-great-grandfather, the king said, unfolding the paper who realized that the words on it can only be seen in the bright moonlight. He renamed the city, the city of bright moonlight, as a reminder for the kings that followed him. Minley looked at the paper as if in a daze. In the moonlight, the page glowed. A single line of faint words, as if written with shadows, was scrawled upon the page in a language Minley had never seen. So, I think this paper, which the old man of the moon said he borrowed, the king said, this written line torn from the book of fortune is the borrowed line you seek. Of course, Minley said, and excitement bubbled up inside of her. It must be. But her excitement popped as she looked at the carefully preserved page and remembered how the king had had it on his person carefully and preciously kept in a pouch that hung around his neck. It seemed impossible that he would give her such a cherished, cherished treasure. It was only after much study that my great-great-grandfather was able to decipher the words, the king said, and that is when he realized that the words changed according to the situation at the time. From then on, Whenever a king of the city of bright moonlight has had a problem, he consults this paper. And the paper tells you what to do? Minley asked. Yes, the king gave a wry smile. Though not the way you think. Sometimes the line on the page is more mysterious than the problem itself. And with that, the king looked down at the line. 
As he read, a startled expression came across his face. What does it say? Minley asked. Um, it says, the king said slowly, you only lose what you cling to. You only lose what you cling to. The king's words seemed to hang in the air. All was silent, except for the soft rustling of the page and the gentle breeze. Minley, unable to speak, watched the paper flutter as if it were waving at her. So it seems your request, the king said, deserves consideration. This line tells me as much. Now, let me think. Minley looked at the king, quiet but puzzled. For generations, my family has prized this paper. We have honored it for its spiritual power and authority. It has been passed on and studied and cherished and revered. It has been valued even above gold or jade, the king said slowly. But what is this paper, really? Minley shook her head, unsure if she should respond. It is, actually, the king said, simply proof of my ancestor's rudeness, his unprincipled anger and ruthless greed. Yet we've disregarded that, and instead we guard and protect this written line so dearly that the rulers of the city of bright moonlight carry it at all times, not daring to let it out of their possession. The moon seemed to tremble as ripples spread over its reflection caught in the water. The king continued again, speaking more to himself than to Minley. We have clung to it, always afraid of losing it, the king said. But if I choose to release it, there's no loss. Minley felt her breath freeze in her chest. She knew the king's mind was in a delicate balance. If he refused to give her the line now, she knew she would never get it. And perhaps it was never meant for us to cling to, the king continued. No matter whom the paper originally belonged to, this is a page from the Book of Fortune, a book that no one owns, the king said. So perhaps it's time for the paper to return to the book. A wind lightly skimmed the water, and Minley could see her anxious face as pale and as white as the moon reflected in it. You only lose what you cling to, the king repeated to himself. He glanced again at the paper and then looked at Minley. A serene expression settled on his face. And then he quietly smiled and said, So, by choosing to give you the line, I do not lose it. And with those words, he placed the paper in Minley's trembling hands. Chapter 24 Outside the city, Dragon waited. Even after Minley had disappeared, the dragon still watched from the trees. He had felt odd when she had passed the old stone lions and the door had closed behind her. He realized that he had never had a friend before, and what a nice feeling it was to have one. And perhaps that was why the second night, when the sky darkened and the moon rose, Dragon crept out from the shadows of the trees and approached the closed, sleeping city. While he wouldn't admit it, Dragon thought just standing by the walled city might make him feel just a little bit less lonely. The silver moon cast a frosted glow upon the rough stone wall and guardian lion statues. Dragon stared at them as he approached the gate. Their stocky, heavily built bodies seemed to weigh down the stone platforms they sat upon, and the darkness of the night made their stiff, curly manes look like rows of carved blossoms. One lion held a round ball underneath his forearm. The other held down a lion cub that seemed to be grinning at him. 
In fact, all the lions seemed to be grinning at him, as if he were a secret joke that they were watching. Am I so funny? Dragon asked them as he passed. Yes, burst out the small lion cub, wriggling free of his mother's paw. You're very funny. As Dragon jumped back in surprise, the lion cub laughed out loud, obviously highly amused at the dragon's shock. But with his laugh, both adult lions shook themselves from their platforms. She mao the mother lion scolded. Don't laugh at the lost dragon. Besides, you know the rules. No moving in the presence of others. But it's a dragon, the cub said. Not a people. He doesn't count for the rules, does he? Besides, he is funny. Big dragon trying to tiptoe like a mouse. Chi Mao, the deep male voice of the other lion boomed in the air. Maybe be like, Chi Mao. The cub gave a half-hearted look of shame and was immediately quiet and still. By this time, Dragon had found his voice. Uh, you're alive then, he said. Of course we are, the male lion said, scrutinizing the dragon with his interested eyes. Everything's alive. The ground you're walking on, the bark of those trees. We were always alive, even before we were lions, and we were just raw stone. However, carving us, did give us a little bit more personality. So, you're a fairly young dragon, aren't you? The female lion said kindly. You seem only 100, 150 years old. Don't worry, you'll learn soon enough. A hundred, the lion cub said. I'm much older than you. I'm 868. Yet you have still not attained wisdom, the father lion told him. Don't tease the young one. Well, what are you doing here? The cub asked, not unkindly. Dragons don't usually come down to the earth much. Are you lost? Though unusual, the lions weren't unfriendly. So Dragon settled down and told him the whole story, being born living in the forest, meeting Ninli, and now their travels to find the borrowed lion and the old man of the moon. The lions didn't interrupt once, though the cub did snicker from time to time. You belong to Magistrate Tiger, the cub said when Dragon had finished. That means you're the terrible dragon. You're the one that destroyed the king's father's palace. What a lot of trouble you caused. Dragon looked at the other lions questioningly. Well, about 100 years ago, the female lion said, the king's father fled his home village. A dragon had destroyed his palace and his people had cast him out, saying he was bad luck. He came here intending to make his home with his son and to live off his son's wealth and power as the king of the city of bright moonlight. There were bad times here for the city, as the king's father and the officials he brought with him were corrupt and greedy. We were very concerned. You? the dragon asked. Why would it concern you? Why would it concern us? It is completely our concern. And then the father lion piped in. We are the guardians of the city. It's our responsibility to watch and keep the city churning. To see it begin to crack alarmed us to no end. And the lion held out the round ball he held in his hand and showed Dragon an old deep fracture that was slowly being filled with the dust of the earth. What did you do? Dragon asked. The story of a string of destiny. Well, we were afraid the city would break. As the times became more turbulent, 
with secret meetings and violent outbursts, we watched the crack in our world widen. It was only a matter of time, we thought, before it would tear completely into two. So one night, as we despaired, we saw a figure walking in the moonlight. Bent and old, he glowed like a lit lantern. When we saw he was carrying a large book and a small sack, we knew instantly it was the old man of the moon, and we called him over. Please help us, we begged him. We need to keep the city together. But the old man of the moon looked at us, our outstretched, cracking globe, and our pleading faces. Without a word, he sat down before us and opened his book, leaping through the pages and stroking his beard. After several minutes of consulting his book, he opened his sack and handed us a red thread. You are to hold this until it is needed, the old man told us, and then slapped his book shut and walked away, ignoring our words of thanks. We knew the old man of the moon had given us a string of destiny, one of the very strings that he used to bind people together. It was a marvelous gift. While he left us no instructions, we guessed that we were to use it to tie around the city if it looked like it would split. So after that, night after night, we watched our sphere, ready to use the strings at the first sign of breakage. Unsure of its power or abilities, we dared not to use it for anything but the direst of circumstances. But the crack did not grow. Unexpectedly, the king renounced his father. He kicked him out. He exiled him and his officials from the city and harmony. He exiled him and his officials from the city. And like that, harmony returned. Slowly, the fracture has filled with the powder of earth and stone, and I have held the string unused. And that is the story of the string of destiny. So as the male lion finished his story, he lifted his paw to reveal a flattened line of red thread. The borrowed line, Dragon said. That's it, Rinley said. She needs to get the borrowed line from the guardian of the city. You're the guardian and that's the borrowed line we need. I suppose it is, the lion said, looking at the string. So perhaps I've been holding it all this time so I can give it to you? And the lion dropped the string into the dragon's outstretched hand. And that's where we stop for today.